Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Soul Row Show. I am Cherie Burton, and this is a podcast that climbs into that intersection between ancient feminine wisdom and the modern path of soul evolution. If you are fans of the show, you know that I am no stranger to diving into Mary Magdalene mysteries. And typically I've gone the mystical route with it. Although I started on my journey learning about Mary Magdalene through biblical scholarship, through kind of that academic, like historical research path, I wanted to bring in Dr. Elizabeth Schrader Pulser, also known as Libby. Uh, She has done some groundbreaking research on Mary Magdalene through a very ancient text, very, very old, old, old papyrus that she was the only person to really take apart. No spoiler alerts, I'm not giving anything away, but you'll want to listen to this if you've been at all interested in sort of the academic piece around what we do know historically and what the ancient papyri tell us about Mary Magdalene and who she was. Elizabeth is uh, an assistant professor of New Testament at Villanova University, and she started beginning her investigation into discrepancies in the Gospel of John in the New Testament. So yeah, really cool. Lots of debates around this in the academic community, but I like her take on some of the stuff around Mary's potential leadership role, why that would have been excluded from our, our surviving texts, and then how historical misrepresentation of biblical women needs to be reevaluated. Enrollment is open for Women's Wisdom Circle. We launch in three weeks, the first day of spring, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, the first day of fall, if you're in the Southern, you can go to standspeakshine.com forward slash WWC, or just go to shereeburton.com, find it right there, Women's Wisdom Circle. And we also have coming up in our Facebook community, Soul Row Show Facebook community, if you haven't asked to join that yet, every month we're bringing in a facilitator to do a hot seat session for someone. We're going to be diving into that next Monday, the 11th at 11 Mountain Time. So look for that. Let's move to our discussion on Mary Magdalene. Elizabeth, also known as Libby, welcome to (laughs) our show. Hey, it's great to be here. And we had a great pre-conversation around some fascinations that we share. You're Mm -hmm. more grounded in the the rigorous academic sort of scholarship-based history and all of the mystery that prevails in the community around Mary Magdalene in that regard. Yeah, that's how she grabbed my life. She grabs everybody differently, though. (laughs) Yeah, we were talking about that, too. I think you said she hijacked your life. I was like, she totally hijacked my life in a way that I would never have. it. Oh, my gosh, (laughs) I completely relate to that. That's what happened over here. Yes. So let's start with your background. I think it's really fascinating. You started with music and then Mm -hmm. from music into Mary Magdalene into now this biblical scholarship path? Yeah. So I, you know, I went to college and I was a music major and then I was in a band and we won this contest and we toured. And I, it's funny because sometimes the themes of my life in music were also centered around divine feminine. Like I won this Pantene contest right after I graduated college. And literally the slogan was celebrating what women have to say. Mm. And I won the contest with a song called Blood Red Moon that was about a late period. <laughs> <laughs> and and so that I was like touring with Jewel and really oh, yeah, like and then I was on an episode of the Gilmore Girls. So these are all very like, you know, you were on the Gil what? That was like yes. my favorite show. Yeah, no, I, I'm one of the troubadours in that episode where Luke and Lorelai are fighting. Um, (laughs) the season six finale there's a a regular theme of sort of feminine voices I mean I think of the Gilmore Girls very much that way and certainly Jewel and like this Pantene slogan it was sort of along the way I realized there was something to do with like the feminine voice and I was so committed to my music career and I was so sure that that's who I was I did it for like 12 years I was a singer songwriter you can go and find a million of my well I don't know, like 50 of my songs on Amazon or Apple Music or whatever. And then kind of out of the blue, while I was living in New York City, I wrote a song about Mary Magdalene. Which, okay, but why did you, know, you my, I'm just curious, why were you drawn in? What do you think that's about? Why Mary Magdalene's song? Big mystery, big mystery. I mean, I was at that time, like not really sure what was going to happen next in my music career. And I had had this interesting meeting with my lawyer, my music lawyer, and funnily enough, Jules' mother. <laughs> and, who, and we were like talking about what to do with my career. And Jewel doesn't, Jewel and her mom do not get along. And there's interesting things about Nedra that, you know, we don't need to go into, but she does have a lot of, I would say she's talented and insightful in certain ways. And I remember in this meeting, Nedra said to me, 
you just need to jump off the cliff. And like the, we had this candle lit and we were in my lawyer's office in New York city. And it was like, it was like this whole sort of music business powwow. And then suddenly I was, I, I was like, okay, I need to go pray about this. And there was this garden dedicated to the Virgin Mary around the corner from where I was living at that time in Brooklyn. And I was praying to, cause I had recently sort of felt that the Virgin Mary was sort of my spiritual guide. And I had recently begun praying the rosary and I heard words in response, which was a total surprise because usually I don't hear words when I pray. I just usually am praying or I get feelings in response. And the words were, maybe you should talk to Mary Magdalene about that. Hmm. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, that's, that's, I was talking to the Virgin Mary. I mean, I have pictures of the garden that where I was praying. It was dedicated to the Virgin Mary. I had all these statues. I immediately like emailed Jules' mother to like tell her about it. I immediately like wrote a song within like two days about Mary Magdalene. Which what is the name of it? Magdalene. <laughs> I'm going to go like, I'm going to go put it into the intro. Like, I think it should. <laughs> There's awesome. a music video. I mean, I did all this stuff thinking, you know, okay, this is about my path in the music business. And so I wrote this song about Mary Magdalene. And then I was just like, oh, you know, I can't write a song and name my record about Mary Magdalene without researching her. So I like walked over to the Brooklyn Public Library. I got my, like the complete idiot's guide to Mary Magdalene and just started like <laughs> reading on her. And then I know you've done this as well. I'm like, oh, I should go to the South of France and like check out these mysteries. Like, wow, mm -hmm. this is cool. And so I found a way to get to the South of France and I was exploring and then it just kind of kept going. And somewhere along the way, I had this thought, which to me seemed really straightforward, which was, okay, so Mary Magdalene was controversial. That's what I learned from the Complete Idiot's Guide. I didn't know there and, was a Complete, complete Idiot's Guide. I wish oh, it's great. <laughs> it's, it's super. It's an excellent introduction to Mary Magdalene. And I was like, okay, so there's controversy around her. And the Gospel of John is the one that features her the most, you know, this scene between Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the garden. And so I'm like, you know, I just, I want to look at the world's oldest copy of the Gospel of John and just see if there's anything funny about mm -hmm. around Mary Magdalene. Does it say something different? Was something crossed out? I was just like, you know, maybe the scholars missed something. Like, I want to look at it, which is a totally ridiculous thing for someone who has no training to think, <laughs> honestly. Like, I'm some singer-songwriter living in Brooklyn, and I'm like, oh, maybe I'll find something the scholars missed. Except that's kind of what happened. I did end up finding out that the world's oldest copy of John, or the most, the oldest substantial copy, is called Papyrus 66. It's dated to about 200 AD. Hmm. And it's a nearly complete copy of the Gospel of John that was discovered in the 1950s. And so I was like, okay, I want to look at that. And I had to sort of ask around and get some scholars. A friend of my hometown parish priest recommended me to a scholar in Manhattan who I sat down with. Her name is Deirdre Good. And she was able to send me a link to a transcription of Papyrus 66, which was unfortunately in Greek. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know how to, I thought somebody would have translated it, but no, this is 2012. And wow. but I was very determined and I used an interlinear study Bible where I could look at every single word of the papyrus, like transcribed next to every single word of the gospel of John. And then like what each word means. And that was maybe a first clue that I was maybe going to be an academic, that I would go to that. But you were on to something. Well, the thing is, I didn't know if I was on to something. But I just, you were following, like, you were following your soul. You were following this, like, we call it the red thread. You're probably familiar with that term. It's just pulling my you, right? My most recent record is called Red Thread. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I'm going to have to send you a copy of my record oh, called please. Red Thread. Oh, my gosh. This is all new to me. Please. Yes. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> uh, that's so funny that you would say that. Yes, it is. It was the red thread. And so I just was looking at it and I looked, you know, in chapter 20 where Mary is talking to Jesus in the garden and it looks like it's supposed to look. And I looked in chapter 19 where Mary Magdalene's at the cross and that looked like it was supposed to look. And just the one thing I hadn't yet done that or that I thought that I should do was to look at John chapter 11. That's the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead because I found out from the complete idiot's guide that some people have always wondered whether 
Mary of Bethany was the same woman as Mary Magdalene, right. the woman who anoints Jesus in John's gospel. Right. Are you, and so, I'm sure you're familiar with Margaret Starbird. Did that find you at that time? The woman It did the eventually. Yeah. I did eventually make contact with Margaret, but not, not at this time. Got it. I was just, you know, just looking at this copy of the gospel of John. And, and so I go to literally the world's oldest copy of the gospel of John. And I'm, I'm going to look at John 11. And if you look at this website, you can see in the transcription and in the photographs of the papyrus that the name Mary has just been crossed out a few times. Not and I was just like, what? what? And so the first time the name Mary is crossed out, well, it's one letter that's changed. The name Maria is changed to Martha. Maria is mm. Mary in Greek. And Martha, it's just one letter's difference because it's a theta in Greek, which is a TH. And then that's in John 11, verse one. And then in John 11, verse three, her name is just super scratched out. It's like Maria and it's awkwardly scratched out. And just from my interlinear study Bible, I was able to see that it's changed to say, hi, Adelphi, the sisters, and that all the verbs have been changed from singular to plural. So it looked like Martha was getting added in to the story. And I'm like, what? I'm like, wait, hold on. This is the story of like, you know, Lazarus and Martha and Mary, those siblings. And, you know, everybody knows Martha and Mary. Those are those sisters and Mary's right. sitting at Jesus's feet. But that's in a different gospel. That's in Luke's gospel. And I was yeah. like, wait and a it, second. And it's like they draw a lot of polarity in religious settings between mm -hmm. Mary sitting at the feet, Martha doing all the work in the kitchen. That's true. It's like, be but more like Mary, not Martha. She was too <laughs> <laughs> The Marys and the Marthas. Yeah, that has a long interpretation history in Christianity. But what's interesting is that in Luke's gospel, they don't have a brother. Uh -huh. And also in Luke's gospel, the story takes place in the north, sort of in Galilee or maybe Samaria. Whereas in John's gospel, it says that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha live in Bethany, which is just outside Jerusalem. So I, I mean, I grew up going to church. I went to the Episcopal church growing up and I was just saying, wait a second, hold on. Just from this oldest papyrus of the gospel of John, it looks like they're sticking in the character Martha into the story. Mm -hmm. And we know where Martha comes from. She comes from Luke's gospel, totally different gospel, totally different story. I'm like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Wait, is Martha and Mary in Luke's gospel different? Then Lazarus and Mary in John's gospel. I was like, I mean, this never would have occurred to me if I hadn't seen with my own eyes that this scribe is literally changing the story, adding mm -hmm. Martha in over the course of a few verses. And then at a certain point in Papyrus 66, Martha is there, but it seems, anyway, the point is I ended up just saying, okay, wait a second. It looks like at the beginning of the story, Martha is getting added in. So I copied it and I sent it to this scholar at the seminary in Manhattan, Deirdre Good. And I said, look at this. Martha's getting added in this world's oldest copy. And she said, oh, very interesting. And she didn't know anything about it. And I was like, wait, wait, hold on. These are world-class Bible scholars. Aren't they talking about this? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. Nobody had really done any work on it. I was like, come on, what have people said about this change? I was able to go back to the Brooklyn Library and get on interlibrary loan and get academic articles. Again, a clue that I was going to become an academic. <laughs> I was like asking for on interlibrary loan from my local public library for really sort of hardcore academic journals. Of That's what so epic say. that you did that. Can I just honor that? Like, Aww. who does that? That doesn't have, That's how you know, it's totally like soul driven and part of your mm. path because most people wouldn't have that fascination to go to those lengths. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. And, I, you know, I also want to credit the Episcopal Church with the way that I grew up, because there was never a time in my life where I was told there was something I could not do. You're so lucky. <laughs> You're so lucky. <laughs> well, I'm grateful. I mean, they just had a, a movie come out about the Philadelphia 11, which are the women who are willing to get ordained in the Episcopal Church. Yeah, I was going to say, that's what I equate Episcopalianism or whatever is with ordaining women ministers. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And, and, I grew up in a world where that was normal. It was never, if I felt a call to the priesthood, I could have followed it. I didn't. I mean, I felt called to spirituality, but then I was like, no, I want to be a musician. I don't want to be a priest. So I want to be a musician. But I think that there's something about the Episcopal church where, or there's something about the formation, not just of women, but of humans, that if you don't traumatize them and you don't like limit them, that they'll just grow. And so I feel yeah. like it wasn't such, I was just like, wait, hasn't anybody done anything about this? The name Mary's been crossed yeah, out. My first thing would have been like, is this okay? Like just from my religious upbringing, like, is this that's, okay? That's interesting. And actually some, that some women have told me that they would feel almost scared to look at the world's oldest copy because it's not their role. And, right. And like, so I, I again, to dissect yeah. a sacred text. That's 
That's my religious leader's job, like to see if this is actually a legit thing. And, you know, some people might get angry at the Episcopal Church that they raise such presumptuous ladies. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I did. I said, I want to go look at this. And so I just got the academic articles and and I found that people had talked about it in the 1960s, soon after the papyrus was published. And one of the world's most important textual critics from the 20th century, Gordon Fee, most respected conservative textual critic, he said, oh, look, the name Mary's been crossed out a couple of times. And oh, look, a woman's been split in two in John 11, verse Ooh. three. That's the strangest change in this entire manuscript. Mm. And that was basically the end of the scholarship. It's like, uh, moving on. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there are a lot of changes in Papyrus 66. I should mention that too. It is the world's oldest copy of the Gospel of John, and there are 450 corrections made to it. So that's another whole other conversation. Right. But of those 450 corrections, Gordon Fee said, this is the most interesting. And nobody followed up, and I don't know why. And so here it was on my plate. I'm some singer-songwriter <laughs> in Brooklyn, <laughs> realizing that nobody's done anything about this. And so I ended up enrolling in a master's program. And so I ended up working with Deirdre Good at General Seminary. It's an Episcopal seminary. And so I didn't study to be ordained. As I said, I don't feel the call to be a priest, but I do feel a call to be an academic. And I also felt the call to do it in a setting where the information would be respected. I didn't want to do it in a secular environment. I, I right. wanted to. You seminary. needed that, that exploratory field you know, you need to be open. Nobody clipping your wings. <laughs> it's my sacred text also. So I didn't want to be taught about it just as history. I wanted to to learn about it in a, in a seminary environment. So anyway, so I, I enrolled in the master's program. And then my master's thesis was a study, not just of Papyrus 66, but over a hundred copies of the gospel of John, because I had to learn ancient Greek. And then I was given resources for how to find other manuscripts and how to research. And it turns out, that dozens of manuscripts of the Gospel of John have been in Mary changed to Martha. One in three. Oh, really? Old, yeah. <laughs> one in three of the old Latin manuscripts of John has some sort of problem around Martha and one in five of the Greek manuscripts. And you can actually reconstruct almost the entire chapter of Lazarus being raised from the dead with just Lazarus and Mary using real manuscripts. And I was like, wait a second. Okay, hold on. Why would somebody want to stick Martha into this story? And I think I felt a real key to it had to do when I found out that this church father, Tertullian, who wrote yes, at the turn of the third century, <laughs> yes, Tertullian, he wrote at the turn of the third century, and he was one of the first to comment on John's gospel. And he says, oh, when Mary confessed Jesus as the Christ. And I'm like, what? Because your Bible would say that Martha confesses Jesus as the Christ. Not only that, but if you read scholarship on the gospel of John, you find out that this is the thesis statement of the gospel of John that Martha utters. It's when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? Which probably some of your listeners know that quote. Right. You're nodding like you're yeah. probably recognizing this, but people don't always remember who he's talking to because the person he's talking to is a minor character. Hmm. So I was saying, wait, hold on. Wait a second. Tertullian thinks that Mary is confessing Jesus as the Christ. And the reason I bring up that I'm familiar with Tertullian is he was not female friendly, which I find oh no 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 that this would come around to Mary. Yeah, but the thing is, is that maybe his copy of the Gospel of John had not been changed because he's writing at the turn of the third century, around the same time that Papyrus sixty six was copied. I mean, he's one of the oldest church fathers that there are. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just in his copy, and Jesus is the Christ, and he's just commenting on the text as he has it. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that might have been around the time that Martha might have been taken from the Gospel of Luke, someone who read the Gospel of Luke. Because, right. you know, in the second century, people started to read multiple Gospels. So if someone knows Luke's Gospel, and they know the story of those two sisters, they're like, you know what, hold on, people are thinking that this Mary of Bethany is Mary Magdalene. They were thinking that. We know that as far back as interpretation history goes. What if you're reading the Gospel of John and Mary's confessing Jesus as the Christ? Mm -hmm. And then she anoints Jesus right after that. And then if you think she's Mary Magdalene, she's at the cross. She's the first one to go to the tomb by herself. She gets the first appearance of the risen Jesus. And Jesus is the first to send her out into the world. This makes so her a super <laughs> threatening central character in the Gospel of John. So why would you add Martha to like fix that problem? <laughs> that is absolutely riveting. So, so Martha, so I'm saying that maybe like Papyrus 66 and all these dozens of other copies are preserving for us this red thread in yes. the manuscript record that shows that maybe Martha is 
there in the Gospel of John as sort of a decoy to distract you away from Mary and her importance in the Gospel of John to make you think of a different gospel. To decentralize Mary, really. Correct. To dilute her and to fracture her, to break her up into three different women. Now she's not Mary Magdalene, the confessor of Jesus as the Christ and the first witness of the risen Jesus, which by the way, makes her sort of a threat and a rival to Peter. Okay. That's not her anymore. Now it's Mary and Martha, those great sisters that I love so much from the gospel of Luke. I love those sisters. You're distracted and thinking about those sisters instead of Mary Magdalene, how similar Lazarus's sister is to Mary Magdalene. Mm. So of course, this is just scholarly theory. But I was able to submit my master's thesis to the Harvard Theological Review, and it got published, which was surprising. <laughs> so cool. I'm like, okay, whoa, <laughs> my master's thesis is published in a top tier journal. And everybody was saying to me, okay, so where are you going to do your PhD? I was like, what? <laughs> I'm a singer songwriter. No, I just wanted you to know about this change in <laughs> virus 66. But the Magdalene had other plans. And so I ended up doing my PhD at Duke. And I just defended a few months ago, and now I'm a professor of New Testament at Villanova oh. University, which is a Catholic school, which also really surprises me. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what? Well, don't happened? you think those lines are like not as iron? They're gray now. Like, don't you think it's more collaborative and every one of all these different faith traditions are kind of mm. in a more of a melting pot? I don't know. I'm not in the academic world that way, but... It I mean, it like... depends upon which environment you're in. I mean, certainly in scholarship, it's more of a melting pot, though. I guess I'm just surprised that a Catholic institution hired me considering <laughs> what I'm saying. You know, I'm like, oh, maybe. Well, Mary you wouldn't Magdalene get hired at BYU. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, I don't know. I never you're know. Surprised. No. Like sometimes, like sometimes it's more conservative institutions that ask me to speak. Like Pepperdine University and Wheaton College are quite conservative and Southern Methodist University. They have all asked me to speak partly because the women in these schools are speaking up and there yeah. might be some moral conflict even within the institutions like, oh, wait, should we really not be fully honoring the gifts of women? And right. what I'm saying is that maybe there was a change made to the origin of Christianity. They're like, we have to go back to our traditional origins, which said that women couldn't do these things. And I'm saying, is that what Jesus wanted? Or is that yeah. what those who had power wanted? And well, yeah. so the That's... text itself is changing. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Well, and I think maybe a lot of listeners aren't especially familiar, you know, with foundational Christian texts and how, I don't know, growing up, I just pictured John writing stuff down and Luke yeah. and Peter and Paul, and they're all writing it down, but that's not the way we got the biblical records. That's not, that's, they weren't even, they, it was oral tradition, right? It was oral. For the first few decades. Yes. And then, so a lot of these teachings were passed down over the generations, you know, let's just say maybe 40 years after even Christ died, right? Mm -hmm. Those that are the right. earliest writings that we have. And so, I don't know, I, I won't get into that too much other than context here. When we're talking about these old records, you're saying the oldest record we have of John is 200 years after Christ's death. Well, yeah. I mean, or let's say it's a hundred years after the gospel was written. Okay. So so, because we're, because I guess I'm, even with the Gospel of John, it's not necessarily about history. It's about what is the evangelist John trying to say? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that someone's interfering with the intention of John the evangelist. John yeah. does purport to be rooted in eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. So you can take John seriously or not on that. You can say John's making that up because yeah. John wants people to read the Gospel, or you can say, okay, maybe John is telling the truth, and there is really a disciple whom Jesus loved who gave this testimony, and then we have to like write that down. And that's so that's a whole different conversation. But if you think that it is grounded in eyewitness testimony, I'm saying that a hundred years after that eyewitness testimony was written down is the earliest copy that we have. So what Got half it. second century? Yeah, I'm saying there's it's like a black box that we can't get to the or we don't know what happened. And I'm just theorizing: is it possible that in that hundred years, this character Martha was added specifically, maybe even so, the Gospel of John could be accepted in the canon because mm. it was too radical otherwise. Right, 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 right. So there's two camps. I don't want to call them camps. I think they blend, but there's like. Mary Magdalene as Jesus's beloved, and then John the beloved. Oh, there's oh. many more camps than that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm really the being what about James here? the beloved. The oh, well, see, yeah, but I'm only familiar with my religious upbringing and how those. Well, actually, what am I saying? It was John the beloved disciple. It wasn't Mary Magdalene in my tradition. Mary Magdalene was never even mentioned, not even hardly on Easter. So, do you want to explore mm. that just a little bit and and how John became the beloved disciple? 
pay just a little break in our episode to let you know that those of you who were on the wait list for the Women's Wisdom Circle, that registration is now live. So this is a six month sacred circle for women way showers. We are going to begin our journey on spring equinox, March 19th. We will end our journey on autumnal equinox, September of this year. Go to standspeakshine.com forward slash WWC, or you can just go to my website, shereeburton.com and you'll see it there on the homepage to find out more. So excited. I actually slashed the price in less than half of what I was going to charge. And so it will include 20 minute clarity call with me, as well as some fun soul declaration cards that I'll ship to you. You will also get six months free of my new mind, body, soul membership. So once again, that's shereeburton.com or standspeakshine.com forward slash WWC. It's going to be glorious alchemy and transformation. I hope you can join us. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the gospel of John purports to be the the testimony of an eyewitness disciple that is anonymous, but throughout it, at the very end of the gospel, it's, well, there's references to the disciple whom Jesus loved throughout the gospel of John. And at the very end in chapter 21, it says the disciple whom Jesus loved is the one who gave this testimony. And, and we say, and we know that his testimony is true. So the gospel of John is anonymous really, but at the end of the second century, the church father Irenaeus wrote this book called Against Heresies, where he's basically railing on all of the sects of Gnosticism, Cessianism, Valentinianism, Marcionism, just all these different types of Christianity that he considered to be heresy. And it is in this work, Against Heresies, that he clearly states that the disciple whom Jesus loved is John. That is John of Zebedee. And ever since, since Irenaeus' work was very influential, that became sort of the standard position throughout the church for mm. all of history. But maybe about a little over 100 years ago, historical critical scholarship really began to question that unquestioned church tradition. First of all, because the Gospel of John never explicitly says that it's John, it's anonymous. And second of all, because in the book of Acts, it says that John of Zebedee is illiterate. So that doesn't really work with someone who's like writing a really sophisticated, it's not just that it's dictating like memories. Whoever wrote the gospel of John seems to have some familiarity with Platonism and with maybe Greek philosophy generally, and has training in rhetoric. And those are things that you couldn't have if you had never, if you were illiterate. So that was one of the reasons that people said, oh, this can't be John of Zebedee, but there's a lot of other reasons. I mean, we could go into, we could have a whole podcast. Yeah, yeah, no, about that's that. It's really interesting. But as for whether Mary is beloved, you're probably thinking of texts like the Gospel of Mary or the Gospel of Philip, which were also published in the 20th century. And they do explicitly say that Jesus loved Mary more than the others. But then again, there's texts like the Gospel of Thomas that say, I think that one actually says that Jesus loves James the most mm-hmm. of everyone. And then there's also the book of Thomas, the contender that says that Thomas is the one that Jesus loves the most. So literally the Is it possible he loved them all the same? <laughs> of course, of course. The question is just the identity of the eyewitness behind the gospel of John. And some scholars have made the argument that Mary Magdalene could be that eyewitness. The trick is that she runs to the beloved disciple in John chapter 20. So they seem to be two different characters. She runs to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. So in that instance, she is not the beloved disciple in John chapter 20. Some people could argue, oh, you know, maybe that part was added or changed. And my response to that would be, show me the manuscript. Right. Because if something is changed in the record, it will leave a trace. That's the red thread that you can find if you look at the manuscripts. Yeah. I, what excites me is that these manuscripts were discovered in the forties and fifties. Right. So a lot yeah. of these, and so it's like to open up this whole world of like Gnosticism and all these other questions and, and rabbit holes to go down for researchers. Oh, the rabbit holes are so big. People don't even know how big the rabbit holes are when they start. I certainly didn't. I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to write a song about Mary Magdalene. I know. <laughs> yeah, well, right. I know. I thought I was just, just going to like, what are they talking about with all these non like major rabbit holes for me myself. <laughs> but oh, yeah. what I want to pivot to is Mary Magdalene herself as we kind of mm-hmm. round out this, the mystery of Mary Magdalene and yes. her title and how she was mm-hmm. given it. I mean, this is again, another rabbit hole, but you have some really interesting takes on what her title's about, how she got it. Yeah. So one of the first things that I had to come up against, if I'm going to say Mary Magdalene is Mary of Bethany, is that doesn't work 
if you hold to the position that she is Mary of Magdala, because Magdala is a different location. Magdala is today, if you were to go to the Holy Land and go on a pilgrimage uh, tour, they would say that this place Magdala by the Sea of Galilee is Mary Magdalene's hometown. And that seems to directly conflict with the possibility that she's from Bethany, even though people as far back as the third century definitely thought that Mary Magdalene was from Bethany. And so what I ended up doing was I wanted to just dig into this a little bit further because I knew that there was a total lack of consensus in antiquity as to what the word Magdalene meant. So some people thought that it was a reference to her place of origin, but some people did think it was a title. For instance, St. Jerome wrote at the beginning of the fifth century. And the thing about St. Jerome is he was the person who translated the entire Vulgate Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. And he also lived in the Holy Land. So he's kind of someone who understands all of the languages as well as the geography and the gospels. I mean, he translated mm -hmm. the gospels. This is more personally. like a credible source of-, of Jerome is one of the most- erudite scholars in antiquity. And he says, no, the word Magdalene, some people think she's is from where she's from, but that's not what it is. It means the word Magdalene means tower. And she was given the title Mary, the tower S because of her faith and her standing by Jesus, you know, and, and her ministering to him. So he was saying that it was a, a represent, it was a title given to her, perhaps he doesn't say explicitly, but perhaps Jesus gave her this title, similarly to how Simon Peter would have been given the title, the rock Mm -hmm. or James and John of Zebedee were giving the title Sons of Thunder. Jesus seemed to like to give nicknames to his <laughs> disciples. So Jerome says Mary was given this title, Mary the Toweress. And so that's the word Magdala just means tower. And ane is a feminine adjective descriptive ending in Greek. So it's like tower s. That's basically so the word Migdal. Migdal means Migdal is, is Hebrew. Migdal is Hebrew and Magdala is Aramaic. Got it. Yeah. So Aramaic is sort of like a later stage of Hebrew. So there is like a different dialect. So basically Joan Taylor, who is really more of the specialist on these things, because she also does archaeology in the Holy Land. She and I decided to put our heads together at, because I am like, no, she really could be Mary of Bethany. And it really might be Mary of Bethany who confesses Jesus as the Christ is given the, the title Tower S. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that is a perfectly legitimate line of interpretation that was held in antiquity. And so to say she is Mary of Magdala is forcing your interpretation into the translation. Yeah. The yeah. word, it, it never says Maria Apo Magdala. That's what it would be in, in Greek, Mary from Magdala. No text says that. It's Maria He Magdalene, Mary the Magdalene. And so if you say Mary of Magdala, it's saying, oh, I know what that word means and forcing everyone who's reading your translation to agree with you. And so this is why it's really important to look at the underlying Greek. And so, yeah, Joan and I did this sort of comprehensive study of all the ancient interpretations of her name. And we basically showed there was no consensus. There's even like Jewish rabbis who confuse her with Jesus's mother. And they say that the word Megadella means hairdresser. Yeah, because please. the verb, <laughs> but the verb gadal in Aramaic would have mean to like pile up hair. Like it's, it's like to, it's like to build yeah, yeah. something up. So it's like, a, is it a tower or is it like you're building a hairstyle? Yeah. <laughs> so, but you can just see there's no consensus. Not, it's not like everybody's like, oh yeah, Mary from Magdala. That's not what people were saying at that time. In fact, nobody said she came from Magdala by the Sea of Galilee until the sixth century. So we're just like, stop calling her Mary of Magdala. Like that is mm -hmm. one possible meaning of the name, but it is also possible that she was given the title and that opens up the possibility that she's from Bethany, which is what ancient people thought. So being from Bethany with the whole Lazarus, Lazarus, I always say his name wrong, Lazarus, <laughs> Martha, because the TH, give us your take on that, that time that there's setting the home because it, it was obvious that Jesus had a close personal relationship with Lazarus and that family mm -hmm. so I mean he did seem to spend a lot of time in Bethany Mark's gospel says that as well Mark's was the first gospel that was written so sometimes people think it's the closest to history and certainly there's this anointing event that takes place in Bethany and it's really a prophetic event in Mark's gospel because it seemed the woman seems to be marking that first of all that he is the messiah and second of all that he is going to die he says that she's anointed him for his burial 
And she seems to be in Mark and then in Matthew, which is kind of based on Mark's gospel. She seems to be the first person to truly understand that he has to die in those gospels. Mm -hmm. John provides a different version of the story. She doesn't anoint him on the head. She anoints him on the feet in John's gospel, but it's still in Bethany. And she is explicitly identified as Mary. And Jesus says, and then Judas is mad at her for wasting the ointment. And Jesus says, leave her alone. So Judas criticizes Mary for wasting the money. And Jesus says, leave her alone. She has done it in advance for my burial. She is going to keep the ointment for the day of my burial. Is that what the immemorial comment was? That's in Mark's gospel. So you got to compare them. And this is what's most tricky. So you were talking about the mystery of the Magdalene. I feel as though the historical Mary Magdalene is impossible to access, especially Mm. in scenes like the resurrection scene or the anointing scene, precisely because Mary seems to have been a controversial figure, possibly even back into her own lifetime. And my sort of theory from looking at all of these texts and comparing them and looking at the manuscripts themselves is that her presence causes the story to warp, whether it be from gospel to gospel. Like, for instance, Mark says that this woman anoints Jesus and Jesus says what she's done will be told in memory of her wherever the gospel is preached, but the name is withheld. Mm-hmm. So you can find out the, the act that she did, but you can't find out who she is. It seems like John is trying to correct this and say her name is Mary. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says she will save it, let her save it for the day of my burial, which is a slightly different spin on it. But the reason that's important is because there's only one woman named Mary at Jesus's tomb in John's gospel. And that's Mary Magdalene. And we know so, unequivocally that that was Mary Magdalene at the tomb. Huh? Like that's... In, John's gospel. But see, again, if you compare the different evangelists accounts, each one is different. And so I'm saying that it's almost like something about Mary causes the story to change depending upon who's telling it. And that's possibly due to controversy about her or something about her presence just causes the story to warp. That actually gives me chills because from my research and my own pilgrimages and, and just really diving into her presence, right? Mm -hmm. It almost feels like she was divine feminine consort, if you will, like she was a Christed or she was on that path of sanctification and the seven devils and all those things. I don't know how we could go on another rabbit hole with that, but it was like, she was so powerful and she was also so human. Mm -hmm. And there was, it was hard for (laughs) her contemporaries to know where to place her as a woman was easier that's, with rabbi and Jesus, right? <laughs> that's kind of my take yeah. on it. Well, I mean, the thing is, I think that there is a case to be made that her presence causes discomfort. Certainly we have sources from the second and third centuries, like the gospel of Mary, the gospel of Philip, the gospel of Thomas and the Pista Sophia, which all say that Jesus is very close to Mary and that Peter has a problem with her, and that the other disciples seem to be jealous of her. And so that is maybe informing us that there's some historical memory, possibly, of controversy around her. And, you know, where are those stories coming from? They're independently attested. These are different manuscripts written by different authors in different places. Yeah. Why does the Pista Sophia remember Peter as being so angry toward Mary Magdalene and the Gospel of Thomas say that? And the Gospel of Mary, these are three different works authored in three different places at three different times. And all of them show some sort of antagonism toward Mary. And so I'm saying there might be, that might preserve some sort of historical record of controversy around her, which if you look at the gospels, the controversy shows up in a different way. It's in the changing of the story. Mm -hmm. So each gospel author changes the story slightly around her to serve their own interests. Mm. And I'm saying that's how, that's why I would say that Mary Magdalene is more likely to be the anointer in, certainly in John's gospel, but maybe historically, I'm saying that the story warped, the story changed, names were withheld, details were moved because there was something about her that couldn't be tolerated. And I'm saying that even if you drill down even further, you can even find that instability in the manuscripts themselves, not just from gospel to gospel, but from manuscript to manuscript of each gospel. As if, as if the author or the originator or the person trying to process the oral tradition, if you will, they were wrestling with 
what was exactly. really going on. Yeah, correct. I think Luke Luke has a big problem with Mary Magdalene for sure. So this thing about the seven devils, you have to ask: is that historical, or is that because Luke? You say, oh, who did Jesus appear to first on Easter morning? Mary Magdalene. Not in Luke's gospel. Yeah. In Luke's gospel, she does not get an appearance of the risen Jesus. And also, Luke had access to Mark's gospel. Almost everybody would agree. And Mark explicitly states that Mary Magdalene is at the cross. Luke withholds that information. There's things about Mary Magdalene that Luke seems to be withholding. Right. And so Luke is the only one that says she had seven devils. The, the ending of Mark it, is, it, is a later composition. It's not by the evangelist Mark. That's another text critical manuscript. I actually kind of like that that made it in there because it's a very esoteric wisdom teaching, you know, that you could dive down another rabbit hole with. It could be, it could be, we have to be careful though. Is that because we want to appropriate something ancient for our own use? Sure. Or that is an interesting line of, of inquiry, but it's also just as possible that Luke does not like Mary Magdalene. But he was literally trying to demonize her. That is one way of looking at it. The thing is, we can't know. Maybe Luke has a piece of information that the other evangelists didn't want to share because they were embarrassed. Maybe Luke knew something that the others didn't. Or maybe Luke is trying to smear her. We don't know. Well, I think her relevance today and why this red thread is drawing many of us in and different Mm -hmm. backgrounds is because this title of the Magdalene that was appointed by Christ, which I love your take on that. Could be, could be. We can't be. I'm just saying (laughs) very compelling. In our day, the relevancy of a woman being given this beautiful Taurus title with leadership, if you will, with, and I, I want to ask one more question about like her status in terms of wealth. And we, <laughs> there's so many questions, more questions I could, anyway, just her making like your research with her making the Christological, what do you call it? The Christological, the Christological confession. confession. Yes, it's Lord. So, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, the one coming into the world. Yeah. So her not only being the first witness at the tomb, but then also making this Christological confession and having all these appearances in these Gnostic texts that we found out and didn't find out about until the 1940s and 50s. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you one more question, and that is about her wealth, her status, or her livelihood. Or I think that's why a lot of people of Magdala, oh, well, she probably came from a wealthy family in that region. And so she was given this title. That's sort of the some things I've heard, and I've struggled with that. I mean, There's, there are places in the gospels that say that she provided for Jesus's ministry out of her own substance. It says that in Mark's gospel, when it introduces her in chapter 15 by the cross. Um, And Luke also says that when he introduces her and her seven demons. (laughs) And so perhaps that is, since it's sort of multiply attested, maybe there is some historical memory of her having some sort of financial independence that could be substantiated by the fact that she's not identified by her husband or her father. Right. Which most women are. Like Joanna is the wife of Cusa, who's, you know, some member of, I think, of Herod's court. So she is, she's also like a woman who has status. And Mary Magdalene is introduced alongside her. So maybe she has some sort of wealth or status. I want to really clearly emphasize that nobody ever said that that wealth came from being a sex worker <laughs> until yeah, the let's, sixth century. Let's clear that one up. <laughs> that's, that's Pope Gregory the Great. Pope Gregory the Great says that Mary Magdalene is a sex worker in the sixth century. And he's like, surely like, you know, she, she perfumed her flesh and forbidden <laughs> acts. And that's where she got the money. And I mean, come on, like that's, that's again, perhaps yeah. part of a smear campaign. Remember our copy of the gospel of Mary is a fifth century copy. This gospel was circulating for quite a long time. It is absolutely possible that people were just like, what's the quickest way to get people to stop taking her seriously? And that would be maybe to call her a sex worker. So, but I love the idea of her kind of being a benefactress of this work and furthering it from a materialist, you know, Jesus's work or sex work. (laughs) Jesus's work. (laughs) I mean, mean, though she has been a patroness of of (laughs) prostitutes. That's important too. I think she kind of absorbs it all. And and gladly so. Like that's the polarity that we're looking at here. Here was this beautiful, you know, mysterious, compelling figure who had some degree of power and wealth perhaps. And and was able to part of this ministry in a certain way that the apostles weren't comfortable with. And, you know, it, it's very, very intriguing, and compelling that they wouldn't know how to place it then. And we don't know how to place it now, but it's coming into the consciousness. So 
many people are being drawn into that through the red thread. <laughs> I think that's exactly what's going on. And yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we can't know for certain. There's so many things that, about her that we cannot know. We right. just can't know because every source says something different about her. All we can do is go as close to the information as possible, which for me is first and second century texts and also manuscript changes within those texts. That's sort of my interest as far as, you know, how she had her wealth or independence. I don't, I just don't think that that can be known, but I think we can argue that she was one of the most prominent women in Jesus's ministry and perhaps a leader of the women because she's usually listed first. And I think you can make a decent case that whatever Simon Peter was with the 12 apostles, maybe there was some sort of equivalent with the women that Mary Magdalene would have been the head of and yeah. that whatever that prominence was suppressed or ignored in the long transmission of history. And that's why it's such an exciting time that we live in when we can see so many manuscripts at once, when all of these texts have come to light and we can now understand and think about them for ourselves without being forced to have a certain interpretation that's been yes. forced upon us. Right. Isn't that the beauty of scripture is being able to, mm -hmm. you know, receive it and take it into your being and see how it's relevant for your own life. I I will say there is a lot of resistance in many steeped patriarchal religious mm -hmm. traditions where they just are not interested in those texts at all. Do you and mean the Gnostic texts? Yes. And some of the others, even the early, the sources that you're talking about, the first and second century. But one of the things I'm excited about with what I found in Papyrus 66 is that most of them are interested in the Gospel of John. Mm. And I'm saying that maybe the Gospel of John has something for us still, that it's been waiting to share. What do you us. think that is? If you could summarize your research there on that papyrus, what do you, what do you think it is? Well, it's very, if you love the gospel of John, you probably know phrases like the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. Another translation of that would be the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not mastered it. Mm -hmm. I would see this as a sort of darkness coming upon the text itself and the text in a very Johannine way lays down its life for the sheep, right? Mm -hmm. The text allows perhaps the death, the death of this character. Also in John chapter 12, Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it cannot bear fruit. So to me, this is a story about death and resurrection. Ooh. Love it. The death and resurrection of the character of Mary Magdalene in the Gospel of John over the course of history, perhaps for our salvation. And that's why I love John's Gospel and why I love that it might be able to do some of the work that the texts that were excluded from the canon, people can't engage with those or they ignore those or they say, oh, those are heretical, but you can't do that to John's Gospel. I'm saying John's Gospel might be operating on a higher plane over space and time even in the way that the text lowered itself to meet humanity where it was at at that time. And now it's rising along with this consciousness of the feminine. They're coming and rising together at the same time. John moves along with the consciousness of the people and meets us where we're at. Well, anything that teaches the death and rebirth and the going into the feminine and looking at your shadows and, and the whole death, rebirth, resurrection cycle to me has been really relevant in my life and the teachings of the red thread that I'm drawn to. So I have loved this. It's so fascinating. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. It's this my pleasure. Fun. It's my pleasure. And I'm so glad to get to know you and your work and to talk to the people who are excited about it as well. And I hope we can continue to stay in touch. Yes. Where can our listeners find you? My website is elizabethschrader.com. If you want to hear my Magdalene song, well, yeah. I guess you well, can I find it Are you there. okay if we put it into this episode? Of course, of course. Yeah, there's like a music video and everything. And at Twitter at L-I-B-B-I-E-S-C-H-R-A-D-E-R, -E -E Libby Schrader. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. And if you love this episode, please share it. Give us a positive review on iTunes and also just share it with your friends. If you have somebody that you think would be fascinated by some of the avenues we go down and the research that I bring forward, please share this episode because I know, 
and feel there are so many people who could be served by the topics that we bring forward. Of course, you can access our archives and go into past episodes for lots more stuff on Mary Magdalene, but I am writing and researching about Mary Magdalene and I love just anything I can get my hands on that will bring this archetypal and historical figure forward into our consciousness like so many other people are doing as well. So thank you again for listening. I hope you have a glorious week. Remember to join our Facebook community, Soul Rose community, our free live monthly sessions and teachings and more discussion deeper into the mysteries and into the real. 